Welcome everyone to the Inland Valley Storytellers and the Delta Word Weaver Storytellers to our celebration event. Today we have uh, eight wonderful storytellers. So we welcome one and all. And this is our second year doing joint celebrations. So we obviously started last year on when we went to Zoom. We zoomed right down to Southern California. So this is a unique event and our second year uh, doing so. We have a few uh, rules of today and that is just keep yourselves muted during the entire event. So reactions can be down at the bottom to clicking reactions or waving or clapping, whatever you like to do, respond silently like that. Um, cut your video, please, if you're going to eat something or even leave the room, just even that little bit of movement is a distraction. So cut your video as needed for leaving. And uh, there's no private chat. It's not available in the chat today. Uh, chat can be a little distracting. So I'm just suggesting you can go ahead and type it out ahead, but then click it to the person you no, not the bird, to everyone between stories or in the middle, we do have some announcement time. So you could also send it off at that time too. So let's get started on our stories because we're here to hear some fabulous stories today. We've divided up the time. So in the first half, there will be two Delta word weavers. There will be two, um, Inland Valley Storytellers, and the same happens in the second half after uh, the announcement time. Celebration has been around a long time, and the Word Weavers, this is our 28th year. And when I put John on in just a minute, he's going to um, tell us how many years Inland Valley Storytellers have also done the celebration event. So I want to introduce, so I'm Marian Ferranti from Delta Word Weavers, and here is our joint group, John St. Clair from Inman Valley Storytellers, and he's going to introduce the first tellers also. John, tell us about how long has your group done celebration? Okay, so um, the Inland, Inland Valley Storytellers started doing celebration in 2003, and that is when I joined the group, and uh, that was my first storytelling experience was in a celebration, and I've uh, told in every single one since 2003. So at this point, what I want to do is read the celebration proclamation. In the name of storytelling, the National Storytelling Network, the Delta Word, Word Weavers of Northern California, and the Inland Valley Storytellers of Southern California are proud to sponsor Celebration, the worldwide event of storytelling at this time of year around the world from Sacramento to Savannah, Boise to Barcelona, West Virginia to the West Indies, Antioch to the Inland Empire of Southern California, over 300 audiences are gathered for this spectacular storytelling event. Without further delay, in joy and anticipation, let the stories begin. And as I understand it, uh, Inland Valley Storytellers is up first with R2, and then I'll turn it back over to Marian to introduce uh, her first two from her group. And it just so happens, I don't need the glasses now, I am the first storyteller. And I'm going to tell you a folk tale from Japan called The Storyteller and the Samurai. Long time ago, an old storyteller, a master of his art, was making his way through the countryside. And as the sun got lower in the sky in the west, his stomach started to grumble and his muscles were beginning to ache from the walking and he knew he needed to find a place to rest and, more importantly, something to eat. Well, his prayers were answered because he came upon a dojo, a school of swordsmanship, 
where young aspiring swordsmen would come to study under a samurai, a master of swordsmanship. And in those days, the custom was a traveler could earn a free night's lodging and a free meal if he would engage one of the students in a sword fight. So the old storyteller turned off the main road and walked up the path toward the door, but before he knocked on the door, he stopped and he frowned because he felt his aching muscles and he realized his aging bones might not do too well in a duel with a young, strong swordsman. But then his frown turned to a smile because he had an idea. And he walked up to the door and knocked very loudly. The door opened and there to it stood a tall, strong young man who said, grandfather, what can I do for you? And the storyteller said, I would like to challenge the samurai of this dojo to a sword fight. Oh, no, 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 grandfather, you don't want to do that. Uh, how about if you challenge a first year student? No, said the storyteller, I want to challenge the master swordsman, the samurai to a duel. Oh, no, 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 grandfather, that wouldn't be good. How about if you challenge a second year student? No, I insist, said the old storyteller. I challenge the samurai to a duel. Okay, said the young man, follow me. And he took the old storyteller inside the dojo and, and took him to a large room where the duels were fought and it was full of young student swordsmen. And he announced, this old man is challenging the samurai to a duel. Someone go get him. Now, someone left to go get the samurai and all the other swordsmen, they looked at the old storyteller with surprised looks because he was old and frail. And when you challenge a samurai to a duel, Unlike students, a student duel is fought with wooden swords, but the samurai duel is fought with blades of steel. And the loser of the battle was often injured and sometimes killed. Well, it didn't take long for the samurai to arrive carrying his sword. And he came into the room and he said, someone get a sword for this man who is challenging. And so one of the students handed a sword to the storyteller who put it on the floor in front of him. And then he just stood there and looked at the samurai. There was a awkward moment of silence. And then the samurai said, you have challenged me to a duel. Now pick up your sword and let us begin. But the old storyteller did not pick up the sword. Instead, he started telling a story. Long ago, there was a small village next to a beautiful stream at the foot of a majestic mountain. And at the end of this, at the edge of this village, there lived an old man. Every morning, this man would get up very early and he'd go down by the stream and he'd listen to the fish tell him about the places they had been, the people they had met, and the stories they had heard. Then the old man would go up into the village and have tea with his friends and share those stories he had heard. Now, as the storyteller was telling his story, a strange thing happened. The samurai lowered his sword and he announced, you have defeated me, I surrender. What, said the students, how could he have defeated you? He didn't strike a single blow. He didn't even pick up the sword. And the samurai smiled and he looked at his students and he said, how many times have I told you the importance of staying in the present, staying in the here and now? This old man has taken me to a place far away and a time long ago. I was completely vulnerable. He could have slain me at will. And so it was. The students at that dojo learned a very important lesson and the storyteller got a free night's lodging and a free meal. Such is the power of a well-told story. 
Okay, the, the next storyteller is um, Adrienne Lowry. And Adrienne has been a storyteller since the first day they let her stand in front of a captive audience of freshman writing students while working on her PhD at USC in the 90s. But a more formal storyteller with more willing audiences over the last 20 years. Adrian joined the Inland Valley <laughs> Storytellers in 2011 and has performed at every IVS concert since the spring concert of 2012. Please welcome Adrian Lowry. And now I need to find her to spot that. <laughs> there she is. Okay. Thank you, John. Well, <clears throat> as a teacher of literature, I, I love short little stories. And some of you may have remembered learning <clears throat> or reading Kate Chopin's story, The Story of an Hour, when you were studying literature. It was first published in Vogue magazine in December of 1894. And I find that it still <clears throat> has some surprises and twists that uh, delight even today. Knowing that Mrs. Mallard was afflicted with heart trouble, great care was taken to break to her as gently as possible the news of her husband's death. It was her sister Josephine who told her in broken sentences and veiled hints that revealed in half concealing her husband's friend Richards was there too. It was he who had been at the newspaper office when the news of the railroad disaster was received with Brentley Mallard's name leading the list of killed. He had assured the truth of it by a second telegram and then hastened to Mrs. Mallard to prevent any less careful, less tender friend in bearing the sad message to her. She did not hear the story as many women have heard the same with a paralyzed inability to accept its significance. She wept at once with sudden wild abandonment in her sister's arms. When the storm of grief had spent itself, she, she went away to her room alone. She would have no one follow her. She sank into the roomy armchair facing the window. Her physical exhaustion pressed her down, haunted her body and seemed to reach into her soul. Through the open window before her, she could see the tops of the trees, all a quiver with new spring life, and smell the delicious breath of rain in the air. In the street below, a peddler was crying his wares, the notes of a distant song, which someone was singing, reached her, and countless sparrows were twittering in the eaves. Patches of blue sky showed here and there through the clouds that piled in the west facing her window. She sat with her head thrown back upon the cushion of the chair, motionless, except when a sob shook her as a child who had cried itself to sleep continues to sob in its dreams. She was young with a fair, calm face whose lines bespoke repression and even a certain strength. But now her eyes stared dully and her, her gaze was fixed away off yonder on one of those patches of blue sky. It was not reflection, but a suspension of intelligent thought. There was something coming to her and, and she was waiting for it fearfully. What was it? She didn't know. It, it was too subtle and, and elusive to name, but she felt it creeping out of the sky, reaching toward her through the sounds, the scents, the colors in the air. Her breathing became tumultuous. 
she was beginning to recognize the thing that was approaching to possess her. And she was striving to beat it back with all of her will, as powerless as her two slender hands could have been. When she abandoned herself, a little whispered word escaped her lips. She said it over and over under her breath. Free, free, the vacant stare and the look of terror that followed it went from her eyes. They stayed keen and bright. Her pulses beat fast and the coursing blood warmed and relaxed every inch of her body. She did not stop to ask if it was a monstrous joy that held her. A clear and exalted perception enabled her to dismiss that suggestion as trivial. She knew she would weep again <clears throat> when she saw the kind, tender hands folded in death. The face that had always looked on her with love, gray and dead. But she was looking beyond that bitter moment, a, a long procession of years to come that would belong to her absolutely. And she opened her arms out to them in welcome. There would be no one to live for her during those coming years. She would live for herself. There would be no powerful will bending hers in that blind persistence with which men and women believe they have the right to impose a private will upon a fellow creature. A kind intention, a cruel intention made the act seem no less a crime as she looked upon it in that brief moment of illumination. And yet she had loved him sometimes. Often she had not. What, what did it matter? What could love, the unsolved mystery, count for compared to this possession of self-assertion, which she suddenly recognized as the strongest impulse of her being? Free, body and soul, free, she kept whispering. Josephine was kneeling before the door <clears throat> with her lips to the keyhole, begging for admission. Louise, open the door. I beg you, open the door. You're going to make yourself ill. What are you doing, Louise? For heaven's sake, open the door. Go away. I I'm not going to make myself ill. No, she was drinking in the very elixir of life through that open window. Her imagination was running riot along those days ahead, spring days and summer days and all sorts of days that would be her own. She breathed a quick prayer that life might be long. It was only yesterday she had thought with dread that life might be long. She arose at length and opened the door to her sister's pleading. There was a feverish triumph in her eyes, and she carried herself unwittingly like a goddess of victory. She clasped her sister's waist, and together they descended the stairs. Richard stood waiting for them at the bottom. Someone was opening the front door with a latch key. It was Brantley Mallard who entered, a, a little travel stained composedly carrying his grip sack and umbrella. He'd actually been far from the scene of the accident and didn't even know there had been one. He stood amazed at Josephine's piercing cry at, at Richard's quick move to shield him from the view of his wife. But Richard's was too late. When the doctors came, they said she had died of heart disease, of joy that kills. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Wow. Powerful story. Thank you. Okay, at this point now, then I will 
turn it back over to Marion, who will introduce her storytelling or, or her storytellers. So spotlight off of me. And there we are. Thank you, John. So the first Delta representing Delta Word Weaver today, the teller is Sally Holzman. We've really enjoyed uh, different stories she has found and also her own personal stories. She brings to us her Southern roots and the Southern charm to the art of storytelling because she shares her craft with all ages. I mean, she's done the wee kids and the older senior citizens. And for many years, she was active member of the Antique Witties, an improv group from Stagebridge. That's a senior theater arts organization. And claim to fame at the recent San Francisco Free Folk Festival, she was a recent Liars Club winner. <laughs> She's founder and hostess of the popular Contra Costa the Tale Spinner Story Swap. Join me and Sally on her journey into her story today. Sally, take it away. Well, good afternoon. I guess you know that uh, animals can talk to each other. And lately I've noticed that there's been quite a few advertisements for people who say that they too can talk to animals and they call themselves animal psychics or animal behaviorists. And if you engage them, they could cost a lot of money. But I knew a man once who really could talk to animals and his name was Mr. Jim Baker. And he was a cotton farmer who lived down the road from us and a friend of my daddy's. Now, if Mr. Baker was like plowing in the field, birds would come and sit on his shoulder and peck at his ear like they were talking to him. He could not pass a corral or a barn without the occupant, a, a donkey, a, a cow, whatever, coming to the gate to, to, to greet him and to say hello. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. And so one Sunday I was out playing in the yard. My daddy said to me, Sally Joy, Sally Joy, I'm gonna go see Mr. Baker. Do you wanna come see him? And I said, of course I do. Cause to go to Mr. Baker's house was like going to the zoo. I mean, he had so many animals. He had pigs and sheep and goats and chickens and dogs with two legs and dogs with three legs. Of course I wanted to go. And when we got to his house, Daddy and, and Mr. Baker, they went up on the porch and I went into the barn to see all those animals. And a little later, I hear Mr. Baker calling, Sally Joy, Sally Joy, come, come sit here with me. I want to talk to you. He was really sweet to little people, to the children. He really was. Well, Sally Joy, how you been? Just fine, Mr. Baker. Well, tell me about yourself. Mr. Baker, I have a question for you. And what is that, Sally? Mr. Baker, can you tell me what animal talks the best? Hmm. Well, let me see, Sally. The blue jay. The blue jay? Yes, the blue jay. Now you should hear the blue jay talk. It's not commonplace talk with the blue jay. Oh no, he has a very large vocabulary. And his words are like right out from the book. And his grammar, his grammar is wonderful. Sally, if you listen to a blue jay, you will understand grammar. Now, people say that cats have good grammar. But I tell you, you get two cats fighting and you will hear grammar that will turn your hair roots white. You will hear grammar that give you a fright. That's what you hear and you will hear words that I couldn't repeat for any little child, but you listen to the blue jay, it's like out of the book wrote words, bristling with metaphors, just bristling. And you know, a blue jay is quite a bit like a human. I know it's got a wings and I know it's got a beak, but it's quite a bit like a human. I'm gonna tell you a story. Story? Yes, I'm gonna tell you a story. You see that piece of land over there with that little log cabin on it? Well, it hadn't been occupied for years and years. 
And one day I was just sitting here on the porch and I looked at that little cabin and on the roof was a blue jay and in his mouth was a acorn. And I saw him get up on the roof and start walking down. Why? Look what I found. And of course, when he talked, the acorn rolled out of his mouth and went to the ground. And he went over and you know what he had found? He had found a hole in the roof, a knot hole in the roof. Why, look at that, look at that. And he walked around to the right of it. And he walked around to the left of it. And then he walked all around it. Wow, that looks like a mighty good hole and it's getting to be near winter. And so he went and flew down to the ground to get that acorn and he brought it back up and he put it in the hole. And then he listened. He listened. I didn't feel it here fall. Well, I'll try another. So we went down to the ground, got an acorn, put that acorn in. I still didn't hear it fall. Must be a very big hole, but I'm going to try it anyway. And so I sat here and I watched. And I watched as that blue jay went from the ground to the roof, from the ground to the roof, from the ground to the roof. I tell you, he must have worked a half an hour. And then he stopped. And he went over and he looked in that hole. And he walked to the left of the hole and he looked in. And he walked to the right of the hole and he looked in. I have put a ton, a ton of acorns in there and I don't see any of them. And he began pacing back and forth on the roof, just exclaiming and exclaiming. And I tell you, pretty soon another blue jay came and they went and both looked at that hole. And then another blue jay came until that whole roof was covered with blue jays. And finally, an old blue jay, he went and he went and flew down to the ground and he went and he went and he went behind the door and he looked and he started to laugh. <laughs> you blue jays, you blue jays, you come on here, come on here. I want to show you something. And when the blue jays got down on the ground and they looked into that room, do you know what happened? The floor was full of acorns. That, that blue jay had tried to fill up a whole house. And it wasn't possible, sweetie. It wasn't possible at all. But you know what happened? Every fall for years, blue jays come to this house. And they look and they go into that little, go through the door and look and laugh and laugh. So I see, so you see how smart a blue jay is, don't you? Mr. Baker. Yes, sweetheart. Mr. Baker, is that a true story? Well, yeah, of course it's a true story. You know that writer fellow, Mark Twain? Well, when he came down here south, he had me tell that story to him and he wrote it up and he put it in the Charlotte Gazette and he called it Mr. Jim Baker's Blue Jay Tale. Sure, it's true. Just believe every word. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. <laughs> the Blue Jay Tale. Next storyteller is, is James Langdell. While he's getting his picture up, I'll tell you that he's a San Francisco native and he's a musician. He plays clarinet, recorders, piano, and he conducts adult concert bands and groups that play for historical social dancing. James retired from a long career as a technical writer, and it in, he included, he worked from uh, Sun Microsystems, both the products, and he was an assistant editor for PC. James' main storytelling activity was, see, he's been setting the stage for pieces of music before conducting them for an audience. There are stories there. 
Today, we're also, we're honoring really his mother, Pat Langdell. She's a long time storyteller in the San Francisco area. And she helped organize and present regional and national storytelling conventions in their early years. The National Story League, you may have heard of, that was founded in 1903. And Pat joined them in like the 1950s. Well, there were two story groups in San Francisco. The Storyland Story League members, they worked at the San Francisco Storyland. And then there was the Golden Gate Story League who told stories in the community. When the two groups decided to merge, Pat Langdale took leadership and she helped found the San Francisco Story League that is active today as a SAC story swap group. She was active in telling stories in the schools and her community and later in life, she's a member of the Asian Art Museum Volunteer Story Corps. A woman of many talents, she even created story theme quilt squares, maybe every year, I'm not sure, for the Bay Area storytelling, because we had that auction quilt that you all know about, she would help contribute to those. And at UC Berkeley, she had a Master of Arts in Political Science. She was active in local politics, especially supporting children you know, and adults. She served as a California state officer in the PTA. She was a licensed parliamentarian, and she was mentored by uh, Diane, our current Senator, Diane Feinstein. She did pass away last year at the age of 98. Now her husband, Dr. John Flangdale, he was also, he, he captured, she captured his interest to be active in the San Francisco Story League. He died this year at the age of 99. He loved magic and he wowed the children as he incorporated magic tricks into his stories. Wouldn't that be so fun? Today, James Langdell is with us, their son. He's telling a story in their honor, presenting Goggle Eyes the Frog. That's one of the tales in Pat's large folder of frog stories. James, tell us about that folder you found. Well, my mother Pat, was long associated with frogs. Our family house was gradually filled with hundreds of decorative frogs. And almost all the frogs were brought to her as gifts that when she would host storytelling or school or parliamentarian or doctor's wives of events at, at our house, people would bring hospitality. They would see frogs there and they would bring more as hospitality gifts. So it just came to be filled with little frogs, some larger. But I want to say something I realized recently, the connection between my mother's political life and her storytelling side, that so many traditional stories deal with laws and rules, you know, they, you know that you know, people try to deal with and sometimes unexpected outcomes and also dealing with leadership in general. And this story, Goggle Eyes the Frog, you know, I believe it's, it's one in her folder that she wrote because she's, she's pretty good about attribution and this was typed and had some corrections. So I think this is one of her own stories, but this deals with an unusually ambitious frog and how his community dealt with the situation. There was a beautiful, not too large, not too small pond that scads of frogs lived along and there were many insects to eat and keep them happy and lots of you know, rocks and stones to sit on, to be in the sun. And one of these frogs was named Goggle Eyes because he had huge eyes. And that wasn't all. He was the largest frog in that pond. And he wasn't too proud. You know, he had no hesitation letting others. He would sit around and you know, declare, I am the largest frog in the world. 
I am the loudest frog in the world. I am the greenest frog in the world. And my legs are the longest of any frog in the world. And he would go on like this at length. And the other frogs were annoyed by that, but got used to that. And then one day, what he was saying started changing. He thought so well of himself, he said, I should be the king of the frogs. I am the king of the frogs. I am the king of the frogs, he declared to two frogs that were around. And then he just kept going on on that as all the frogs gathered and find what is the ruckus here? So the first two frogs that he was telling us to, Freddy Frog and Frida Frog, they sort of talked with each other of what are we going to do about this? It just can't go on. And then after some day, days of this, Freddy told Frida, I have, I have a plan. And, and they you know, waited until Goggle Eyes was, was asleep. That was part of their plan. And Frida said, if he was awake, he'd be saying, I'm the greatest sleeper in the world. But the, you know, so they told the other frogs the plan. plan and Freddy Frog started out saying, here's the plan. We will make him our king. And the other frogs went, what? And he, he said, no, listen to me. And they heard his plan and they all agreed to it. So when Goggle Eyes woke up, they, they said, Goggle Eyes, we recognize your greatness. You are our king. Our, you are the king of the frogs. And Goggle Eyes was astonished and so happy. He says, I'm so glad you recognize my greatness at last and that I will be your king. And he said, we will enable you to be a wonderful king. And they led him over to a large rock where you know they had woven uh you know the river the the pond grass into a, a very comfortable cushion sitting on the rock and you can sit on this as your throne but first you know freddy had taken some river grass that was woven into like a roman you know into a reef that could go on on his head to crown him and Frida had made with longer strands of river of pond grass a robe that it would connect at his neck and just stream all down from him over the over the rock he was on as a throne. And so they installed him as the king and honored him greatly. And, and he said, Well, this is wonderful. Why? But but I'm a little hungry now after my long nap, and said, don't worry, and they brought some of the finest insects that they gathered onto leaves arranged beautifully and brought them up to him to eat as he sat on his throne. And they kept bringing him more insects to eat there. And he said, okay, that's, 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 that's quite enough. I think I will go for a swim. The pond looks lovely from up here and said, oh, no, 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 you are our king. You are our king. We can't risk having you go in the water. And no, no, you you just stay up there. And he, no, I insist, I want to. And then the frogs just all gather in the water below. So there was no, you know, no room for him to jump, jump in there. And so he settled there and after being... As some time's gone on with him being on the throne as their king, he said, oh, such a sad king am I to be here and not be able to leave my throne. I don't want to be king anymore. And on hearing that, you know, Freddy Frog came up and said, well, you, we want, to, you know, there is something you can do to no longer be king, but you have to agree to that. And okay, I'll I'll do that. And Freddie said, "You need 
and we don't want to hear any more about being the largest frog and Frida said and be not be the lo loudest frog and the not the greenest no more of that no more bragging about your long legs it says you can we will still call you goggle eyes because your eyes are really the largest any of us imagine any frog having so to me that and she was Said, oh, I am so happy. Now can I go in the pond? And said, oh, yes. And the frogs cleared away. And he made a magnificent jump from his rock into the water and swam happily. And he never was a braggart again to the other frogs. They lived together much more happily. That's the tale of Goggle Eyes the Frog. Thank you, James. <laughs> That's been very fun to hear your mother's stories, uh, especially, and then live with all those frogs in your house. My goodness. Well, we're, you know, we're still sorting through things. There's a lot to deal with this. But one thing I've been doing is gathering a lot of her storytelling related things that, you know, of folders of stories she's done, books she's collected things from, and there's a lot of various records and things of the, like, in the form of scrapbooks, including from before her time with this Tory Lance, Tory League, you know, that, you know, giving the history, history of it. So just try, trying to find good things to do with them. Uh, her, she was a uh, ahead of us and influenced some of us and kept the uh, the San Francisco swap group going and as we said helped with the national level in it all before any of us started Pat was there first <laughs> so we appreciate her life and thank you for coming to honor her today thank you so much James Next, we're gonna have a few, just a few announcements before we go to our second half. Uh, we're not having a break per se away from the computer, but really anytime you need to leave, you know where the bathroom is, right? You know where the drinks are, help yourselves. The first announcement is about Delta Word Weavers. Now we're not having any, uh, swap in December and we will reconvene on January 9th, second Sunday at 2 p.m. The Inland Valley Storytellers will meet, uh, they meet on the second Tuesdays at 7 p.m. So they're meeting on December 14th and January 11th. And but all these are on Zoom. They're all, uh, you can find out more about them by going on the Storytelling Association of California that's what you typed in to go to the home page of their website. Then look up uh, Story Swaps. There's a nice menu on the left side of the home page, and you can ac access all kinds of information and events from their menu choice on their uh, website. The next thing that SAC has is their genre stories. And this is uh, where it beginning the second year of the genre stories each month is a different genre. And coming up is December. They need some more tellers and they need more, uh, and really for the rest of the year, you can look up what the topics are. Then you need to contact your local story swap because tellers are nominated by story swaps. And it's fine to nominate yourself, but you gotta go to your story swap leader so that they are the ones to nominate you. The topic in December is sacred and inspirational stories. The topic in January, on January 11th, is tall tales. Then the, the sack, let's see. Oh, then there's, there's six celebrations, and I know there's even more than that. There's six celebrations uh, on the sack list. Uh, but I know that additionally, some of the uh, swaps are also having an individual story time with celebration. So again, go to Storytelling Association, 
click on Telebration and you'll see the entire list. You do need to register just like you did today for anyone and their free donations are possible. And John will talk about that in just a moment. Uh, and then joining SAC is really worth it. It's only $30 a year or $50 for two years. And maybe John will talk a little bit more about that because that's one way that you can support storytelling in California. And uh, Storytelling Association has, is behind us all the way. So we appreciate them and even for uh, presenting, helping us to present to all of you today as listeners. John, tell us more about how we can support the various uh, yeah, entities that are supporting our event today. Okay, I will do that. So, Telebration started in, in 1988, and the main sponsor, uh, although it wasn't called that at the time, was the, is the current National Storytelling Network, NSN. And uh, the early Telebrations actually were used as a fundraiser for the Storytelling Association uh, to get that going. And later on, they, we kind of got away from that. And I know the England Valley storytellers have, have used um, celebrations to be fundraisers for our group. But we need to remember, um, especially those of you who are active storytellers, it really is a good idea to uh, become a member of NSN. And for those of you who are not, um, it's... Uh, a very worthwhile organization you can donate to. So I just put into the chat section some links. There are three links I put in there and you can look at them while I'm talking. Uh, the first one is the joint celebration webpage that I made for this joint celebration between Delta Word Weavers and Inland Valley Storytellers. And it has uh, at the bottom well, starting about in the middle going down, it has the bios of all the tellers telling stories today, but up above that, it has links to donate. So um, if you click on that one, you can get to uh, links for NSN and for Storytellers Association of California, SAC, and also instructions on how to donate to either Delta Word Weavers or Inland Valley Storytellers. Now, I also included a direct link to the National Storytelling Network, their donate page. You can go there if you want to donate just to that one. And then I also put a link to um, SAC, Storytelling Association of California. And it's the uh, celebration online events. But if you scroll down to the bottom, it has a donate button on that page. And if you click on that, it allows you to donate to SAC and it also from there, it will take you to NSN to donate there. So lots of different ways that you can support storytelling, which uh, is very important in my opinion. And, and I suspect uh, everyone here uh, believes in the art of storytelling is something that's very worth preserving um, and promoting. So, um, uh, one other thing I need to talk about is the chat section. So if you want to save the, sat, the chat section uh, to your computer so you can click on those links later, if you look at the right-hand bottom part of the chat section, and by the way, if, if, if you don't know what I'm talking about, chat, in the middle of your screen, there's a little talking bubble that has the word chat underneath it. And if you click on that, it uh, creates a little box on the right hand side of your screen. Then once you're in that chat box, down at the bottom, you'll see three little dots. And if you click on those three little dots, it gives you um, different options. And the first one is save chat. So you could click that right now and save what's in there right now, or you can wait until the end of the program and click save chat and get the whole thing or you can do it both times if you're afraid you might forget to click at the end, although I will remind you to save the chat at the end, but 
uh, for instance, if you won't be around for the end of the program because you have to go do something, uh, you might want to save the chat right now so that you have uh, all the comments in there, including the links that, that I just put in there. Um, and so I think that's all I was supposed to talk about. And, and um, I'll send it back to Marion. Thank you, John. We have uh, two more Delta Word Weaver tellers and two more Inland Valley tellers. Our next Delta Word Weaver storyteller is Eleanor Clement Glass. She volunteers extensively in San Francisco Bay Area in the elementary schools, and she just delights children with folk tales from around the world. She works with the San Francisco Asian Art Museum, the Stage Ridge Senior Arts Program for the, and for the Storytelling Association of California. Now, once she learned that the Asian American Storytopia YouTube channel dedicates its programming to positive Asian American stories, she began telling stories with them. Recently taking more classes from StageBridge, she's added personal stories from her Black and Filipina cultures to her repertoire. And she tells them locally, and she even told some at the National Storytelling Conference recently. She's got a lot of world experiences from childhood to bring to her stories. So many addresses when she was growing up, she started preschool in an all German school in Stuttgart, Germany, then moved to North Carolina. She started Catholic elementary school in New Jersey, but moved to Southside Chicago. She went to a middle school at International School Bangkok in Thailand, began high school in Kansas, and transferred to a Marin County High School to finish. Wow. What was it like, Eleanor? Like moving around, making new friends, searching for your place each time you moved, especially when you get older, you know, those teen years. Oh my goodness. Let's learn and hear about that from Eleanor, finding our place. Eleanor? She's going to unmute. Unmute yourself. All right. Thank you, Marion. There. Good. Growing up, I was an Army brat, the daughter of Lieutenant Colonel William J. Clement, Jr. We moved around a lot. We moved all around different parts of the country and also overseas about every two or three years. I liked moving. I liked living and exploring new places, but it was always a challenge being the new kid, trying to make friends and fit in. I spent my middle school year, seventh and eighth grade in Bangkok, Thailand and went to ISB, International School Bangkok. That school took students who were the the family of international diplomats and the military. And I had friends who were from different countries, different nationalities, different cultures. It was such an interesting experience. I had some unique experiences too. The school set up a field trip one time that, and, and I'll never forget this, it was to a cobra farm. So we went to the cobra farm where poisonous snakes were crawling over one another. And every now and then they would raise up and flare their collars and stare at us with naked hostility. The handlers would come in in complete rubber suits with long rubber gloves and rubber boots. And they, at feeding time, would take a long spear with a metal, two-pronged metal um, hook and catch a snake right under its collar. And then when it opened its mouth, they would puncture a piece of meat in meat buckets and stuff it into the snake's mouth and then 
pull it manually part way down so the snake could digest it later. That was an amazing experience. Well, soon after that, my dad got an assignment to go to Leavenworth, Kansas. He was supposed to learn about military strategy at the Command and General Staff College of the Army there. So we packed up and we were headed for middle America. We had never lived in the middle of America before. And I have to tell you, there is nothing in my experience at ISB that prepared me for high school in, Thailand, in um, Kansas. There was no uh, high school on the army base. So I went to high school in town. My mother who's Filipina walked me to school on the very first day, registered me for classes. And then I was alone walking down the halls of the new high school with the gray lockers on either side. And there was a sea of black and white faces coming towards me. It was very different from ISB. And then I, I almost bumped into four big white boys. They were jocks, they had athletic jackets on. They were blocking my way. And one of them looked me up and down. What are you, Vietnamese? And then the boys laughed and just as I was going to answer, no, I'm black and Filipino, they brushed brusquely by me and almost knocked my book bag right off my shoulder. I went home that night. I thought it was so curious that they thought I was Vietnamese. I don't look Vietnamese. I told my dad and my dad said, well, maybe they saw your mother walking you to school and it is 1964, maybe their whole frame of reference for Asians is the Vietnam War on TV. Maybe they don't have another frame of reference uh, for people who don't look just like black people and white people in Kansas. Well, I tried to make friends. I, I was smiling and trying to welcome people, but they tended to just look away or look through me, I, I felt invisible. So in September and most of October, I ate lunch by myself at that school. But then Susie and Anne, who were in my homeroom class and two other classes, they invited me to have lunch with them. So I had somebody to sit with at lunch. I was so happy to finally have some friends in this foreign place. Soon it was the Christmas dance. I was so excited. It was my very first high school dance. Well, I, my mother had bought me a beautiful red dress with new shoes. And she drove me to the gym where I was going to meet up with Susie and Anne. We walked up the wooden bleachers and found a spot right in the middle. And there we could look down and we watched a smattering of white couples right in front of the band dancing. And way in the back, way in the back, there was a circle and the circle was all black kids. They were clapping and dancing and laughing. They were having so much fun. Oh, I wished I would be asked to dance, but I didn't really know any boys at that school. And then, two boys broke away from the circle and they started coming up the bleachers and they were walking toward our little group. And one of them walked up to me and said, oh, would you like to dance? And just as I said, oh, I would love to. And I started to stand up and they looked at each other in surprise. Oh, and then they, they started backing away looking at me curiously. I saw them drop down the bleachers and walk back toward the circle and a swarm of black boys went around them. They started talking animatedly and pointed up at me and many of the black faces turned 
and looked up at me. I didn't know what was going on. And then a miracle happened. One black boy came from the circle up the bleachers and he said, hey, would you like to dance? And I said, I would love to. And he took my hand and we walked down the bleachers. He's holding my hand so I'm not gonna trip. And then we danced. Oh, that was so fun. And then another boy, boy asked me to dance. And then another, I was giddy with delight. I just stayed in the circle dancing. And then at intermission, I looked up to see my friends, Susie and Anne, and they weren't in the bleachers. Oh, I, they were right on the floor of the gym and they were, they were coming right at me, unsmiling. And then Susie grabbed my arm and said, come with me right now. And Anne flanked my other side and they pulled me. Susie pulled me and Anne pushed me into the girls' bathroom. And then Susie whirled around and said, what are you doing? Why are you dancing with those niggers? I was shocked. I was furious. I pulled my arm from hers and I looked right at her and I said, because I am a nigger. Her head flew back as if I had punched her. And then her face turned a blotchy red and the color started rising into the roots under her blonde pixie curls. Her nostrils flared and her, her lip curled. She narrowed her eyes and she came super close to me. And when she screamed, the spittle sprayed my face. No, you are not. You are not. And then she looked at Anne for confirmation and said, she can't be. This can't be. They started to corner me and I escaped into the hall. And then I went right back to that circle and I danced every single dance until the end of the dance and my dad picked me up. I was never so happy. That was the last day at that school. Well, soon after that, my dad got his next assignment. It was to the Presidio, an army base in San Francisco, California. Well, we piled into the family Chevy and drove to California. And I can tell you, I was never so happy to see all those beautiful hills and the Golden Gate Bridge. And I knew. I was not in Kansas anymore. And I hoped I had seen the last of poisonous snakes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Eleanor. A very important story to tell. We need to listen to each other's stories. Thank you for bringing yours to us today. So Great telling. telling. Great telling. Thank you. At the end, we can have, have more general uh, comments to the tellers. Uh, Word Weaver's, Word Weaver's other storyteller is Andre Lamont Wilson. Now, you know, he almost retired as a storyteller, but COVID brought him out of that. You see, he was working for a nonprofit program for the disabled that provided all in-person services, COVID interrupted. His program scrambled, what are we gonna do now? And they were brainstorming, what are they gonna do? What could they do that was meaningful? Well, then the executive director remembered that she used to rehearse stories for them and, and they really enjoyed that. They could go in that direction. She called on Andre. 
called on Andre to teach storytelling class on Zoom and he accepted because he'd already been doing it before, but now he could do it in work. He finds now he, he's teaching those uh, clients storytelling and he'll often start his classes with, he'll pick a riddle, a folk tale, a fable, song, poem, personal story. He has a lot to offer. And for a year now, he's been teaching storytelling and mentoring the next generation of tellers. Let's hear from Andre, who's going to take us on a journey from the middle, no, from the East Africa to ancient Egypt, uh, ancient Greece, in his comparative storytelling of a popular folktale newly named The Boy Who Cried Hyena, Andre. Uh, thank you, Marion, for that introduction. Long ago in Kenya, there lived a man named Indothia. He used to stagger home drunk every night. Just before reaching his hut, he would cry out, Ooh, ooh, ee, ee, ooh, ooh, ee, ee, in booty, come quick with the torch, a hyena is attacking me. Now, ooh, ooh, ee, ee is the combo word for help, and in booty is the name of Ndatha's wife. And she would hear him uh, calling her, and she would come out running with the torch. But when she reached the spot from whence her husband called, all he found was him lying drunk in the dirt and no hyena around. So Mbuti went back home with the torch. The very next night. Indafia staggered home drunk again. Just before reaching his hut, he cried out, ooh, ooh, ee, ee, ooh, ooh, ee, ee, in booty, come quick with a torch, a hyena is attacking me. And Mbuti heard her husband calling her, and she came out running with a torch. But when she reached the spot from where her husband called her, all she found was no hyena and her husband passed out drunk in the dirt. So Mbuti went back home with the torch. On the very next night, Indothia staggered home drunk again. And just before reaching his hut, he encountered a real live hyena in his path. And that hyena laughed at him. <laughs> and Indothia cried out, ooh, ee, ooh, ee, ee, and booty, come quick with the torch. A hyena is attacking me. And his her his husband, hus, her husband, his husband, her husband, his wife heard him and said, There's no hyena. I'm not gonna fall for your lies again. I'm going to take a nap and I'm going to let you sleep it off in the cold breeze. And then I will get you in the morning when you are sober. So Mbuti took a nap. Oh. oh, I'm going to check on my husband in this morning and I bet he is sober now. I'm going to bring him back home so he can get some rest. So she went out looking for the spot from where her husband had called her the night before. And when she arrived, 
Oh no! I hyena torn my husband to pieces. He's dead. Oh, why did he have to sound false alarms? Why did he have to drink too much? Why did I take the chance? If only I had come out with a torch one more night, I could have saved my husband. It is the day you go naked. It's the day you meet with your in-laws. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Four thousand miles and four thousand years later, in ancient Greece, there lived a shepherd boy who tended a flock on a hill. Now this shepherd boy got bored just watching the sheep all the time, and just for fun, he decided to run down the hill towards the village down below. And he would cry out, wolf, wolf. And the villagers heard him and came out running with their sticks. But when they arrived, all they found was no wolf, a peaceful flock of sheep, and the shepherd boy laughing at them. <laughs> And the villagers went back down the hill with their sticks. Well, that prank worked very well the first time. So on the second day, the shepherd boy decided to pull the joke again. He ran down the hill towards the village, calling out, Wolf! Wolf! And the villagers heard him and came running up the hill with the sticks. But when they arrived, all they found was no wolf, a peaceful flock of sheep, and the shepherd boy laughing at them. <laughs> I found you! And the villagers went back down the hill with their sticks. On the very next day, a real live wolf attacked the flock. And the shepherd boy, he went running down the hill yelling, wolf, wolf, a real wolf is attacking me this time. And the villagers, We won't fall for your lies this time. You fooled us once, but you won't fool us a third time. So the villagers ignored him. And by and by, when the evening came and the shepherd boy did not return from the hill with the flock, the villagers went up to him and the villagers found all of their sheep torn the bits and partly devoured by a wolf. And they saw the shepherd boy crying. <laughs> the, 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 the wolf, 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 wolf <laughs> attacked and killed all of the sheep. <laughs> and the villagers, they were very wroth and they said, <sighs> There is no believing a liar, even when he speaks the truth. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to Andre. Inter entertaining, interesting and pulls us back to stories we know in new ways and important to listen to. Are we gonna listen to the liar? Decide each time. Yes. Thank you, Andre.
You're welcome. My pleasure. And now we'll turn it over to the other two Inland Valley storytellers from John St. Clair introducing them. John? Thank you, Marion. And um, the next Inland Valley storyteller is Ron Chick. Now, Ron is a retired teacher, having taught for 34 years as a resource specialist teacher. And he was telling stories in the classroom for over 30 years. Now that he is retired, he goes all over to tell stories. He, he is an act, well, before COVID, he was uh, an active member of almost every storytelling group in Southern California, and he would drive long distances just to be able to tell stories. He loves to tell stories. And he um, has been a member of the Inland Valley Storytellers for well over 10 years and uh, is always willing and um, available to tell stories in our concert. So um, I would like to uh, introduce Ron Chick. First, I have to unmute. Hello, everybody. I tell a wide variety of stories, eh? but this is a sort of Christmas's story that is absolutely true, unlike so many of our tales. It was the Sunday before the last week of school before Christmas break, and Isaac was miserable. He had learned just that Friday before that it was tradition in their small town to give your teacher a gift on the last day of school before Christmas break, hearkening back to the days when teachers were often paid with goods and services. He had gone home that night and said, Mama, I, I need some money. I want to buy a gift for Miss Wilkins. And her mother stopped what she was doing and said, Isaac, we do not have enough to, to, to even have a decent Sabbath. Why should we get a gift for that teacher with her car and her nice home? Please, Mommy, he pleaded. She shook her head, but reached into her purse and pulled out a nickel and put it in his hand. Even in 1934, that was not much money. Nonetheless, Sunday, middayish, he set out. He went to the nicest store in town, but could find nothing that he could even consider buying. And so he went to lesser stores and then other stores, but nothing in his town could he find that he could give to the only person who had been kind to him outside of his family, eh, since they'd come to America. Discouraged at last, he's headed back home, but decided he would cut through some alleyways, trying to take a shortcut back to his part of town. And as he cut down an alleyway, he ran across a place that would only be in a back alley. I guess they called it a store, but it was more like a collection of junk and things that other people had abandoned. But he stopped and looked at the window and his face lit up. There was a big stack of blocks of white soap with a sign that said, two for a penny. He went inside, picked up 10 blocks of soap and walked up toward the front. As he was waiting his turn, the worst possible child came up behind him. Unfortunately, every school occasionally has a kid like Jason. Tall, fast, strong, smart, and mean as a snake. He came up behind Isaac and said, so Isaac, you finally gonna take a bath? The sarcasm was lost on him, or maybe he was just too excited. All he said was, Miss Wilkins, Christmas. Jason turned quickly away and went out to his friends and said, you know what that stupid Jew boy is going to do? He's going to give Ms. Wilkins soap for Christmas. It's Don't anyone tell him. No one say a thing about it. 
This is going to be rich. Monday morning, Isaac noticed that some children were looking at him strangely, but he was used to being looked at as a stranger. And he was very excited about the week ahead. Friday morning finally came. The children from around town arrived with beautifully wrapped packages. Isaac walked in with a cardboard box tied with brown string, for he could not afford any kind of wrapping. The morning wore on, there was a program, and then the party, and then everything was cleaned up, and finally it was time to give the teachers their gifts. Miss Wilkins was a wise teacher. She knew there was something going on in her classroom. She opened all the other gifts and exclaimed over the sweaters and gloves and jams and even a whole ham that were given to her. Yeah. And last of all, she looked at the cardboard box. She thought about opening it in private or, or not opening it at all. And then she saw Isaac's shining face. So taking a stern look around her classroom, she slowly reached forward, pulled the box to order, untied the string and lifted the lid. Oh, she reached into the box and pulled out a camel, a camel carved in such exquisite detail that when she set it on the tabletop, you felt like it would run across. Out came two more camels, ox and ass, wise men, shepherds, sheep, Joseph, Mary, an angel, finally a small cradle and a tiny, tiny child. Then she picked up the box and turned it forward to show that it was beautifully colored inside to make a manger see. By this time, many of the girls were crying. Many of the boys were looking at Isaac with looks of amazement and respect. As the children made their way out of class that day, Jason was heard to say, cakes of soap, huh? Isaac did not stay long in this his adopted country. He went to Hudson University on scholarship where he earned his bachelor's, doctor, master's in Johnson's all in art. In 1964, he made Etza to Israel there to teach in her colleges, a defender in her wars, and create works of stone and bronze. His statues stand outside the Kistnet in Tel Aviv, and in such museums as the Morton Simon Museum, just a few miles away. But in a small Midwest school, on display each Christmas season, is a beautiful tribute to a teacher and to this everlasting truth. You need not be young, old, rich, poor, black, white, brown. It matters not at all if you are Christian, Muslim, or Jew. All you need to say the season of joy is love. An absolutely true story. Mm. Thank you, thank you, Ron. That was a wonderful story, wonderful story. Okay, so um, the last storyteller is uh, Angela Lloyd. Angela is a teaching artist, storyteller, and musician who has been performing for over 30 years. She has performed as a featured teller at the National Storytelling Festival three times and received the Circle of Excellence Oracle Award in 2013 given by the National Storytelling Network. And Angela has asked me to mention the fact that this summer on July 8th and 9th, she is going to be performing live at the Sierra Storytelling Festival. They are going to do a live festival and, and that's a, a nice venue. I've been there, it's, it's outside. So um, it's a little easier to do uh, performances outside safer than inside. 
And uh, I believe she may even um, put a link into the chat uh, as to how to get some information about that. So uh, without further ado, as soon as I scroll through here, I'd like to introduce Angela Lloyd. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Uh, I have a story and a song. And we're in good time, so that's lovely. Because um, there's more celebration when we're done. <laughs> um, I wanted to share a story that I learned from a collection of Rumi's prose and poetry. So he was in the 13th century. He was a writer and a poet and a mystic. And one of the things I love about um, some of the stories about himself and as a storyteller and poet is that he often did his telling, told his poetry while one arm was wrapped around a column and he would just simply circumnavigate the column and speak spontaneously. And there were, he had a scribe write down what he was saying. So raise your hands and wave if you would also sometime like to be doing that and someone would scribe for you what you were saying. Yeah, so I'm just gonna check out the gallery, how many people would like that. Yes, it'd be very good. So, um, so I, I love that image of him in the 13th century and his spontaneous telling of his inspiration. So this is one of the stories that he told and someone else wrote down. <laughs> there was once a merchant long ago who often would make his way into a town and it was a bit of a ride. So he didn't go very often and neither did many people, other people in his home. So before he would go, he would often walk around his home and he would talk to his children and his family, his relatives, if there were those who lived there with him and sometimes even the servants and he would ask them what they wanted. What could he bring for them? And so the as he made his way around, people asked for things like one of his daughters asked for a silk scarf. Another asked for something to pull her hair back. Um, all kinds of um, things were asked for, including fruits or vegetables. And so he he had a list. And as he made his way back into where he did his writing, he his he glanced at the cage and a parrot that lived in a beautiful cage in his study and just very casually and without much thought he just turned to the parrot and he said is there something i can bring you from the village and the parrot um fluttered his wings and he said you know there is something you could do. You see, the meadow where I grew up is between this house and the village. And I'm wondering if you might take a message from me to my relatives. Um, see, if you could let them know that I'm living in a gilded golden cage and I have a good life, but tell them I miss their voices, even the sound of their arguing. I miss them so much. Would you tell them that for me? And the merchant said, yes, uh, we will we'll keep an eye for the meadow. The parrot said, there's a long line of trees where we live. And if you listen when you're making your way, I'm sure you'll hear them. <laughs> So the merchant made his way to the village and he noticed the meadow on his way to the market, but he did not stop until he was on his way back. And 
it, it was, you know, a certain amount of time at the market to complete the things that people wanted and it was bright and sunny. So he was a little sleepy on his way home. But as they were getting close to the meadow and um, he was riding in a carriage that was pulled by a horse and there was a driver. I don't think I told you there was a driver. But as they approached, he was coming slowly awake and he heard the sound of the parrot. And he asked the driver to stop and he got out and he stepped across the dirt road and into the meadow. And sure enough, there was this big sound of all these parrots. And so he strolled out into the meadow. He'd never done this before, you know, delivered a message. <laughs> so he was a little cautious, but he made his way to the trees where he could actually see parrots close up in the branches. And then he called the message to them and he said, I have a message from one of your relatives and he wants you to know He's living in a golden cage and he uses his golden voice and he wants you to know that he misses you. Even the sound of your arguing, he really misses you. And he looked at the parrots and noticed that they would all stopped chattering. And then just right in front of him, he saw a parrot fall and it landed on the ground up ahead. And so he approached it and it was as though the parrot was dead. And, and he was so surprised and he thought, oh my goodness, I, this message I gave, it, it's caused, I think it caused a parrot to die. Uh, He turned around and he got in the carriage and all the way, rest of the way home, all he could think was, I'm going to have to tell my parrot this, what happened. And he was like, I don't want to tell him <laughs> how sad. So when he got home, he took his time going around and giving everybody everything and listening to them. And then he made his way into the study and the light was starting to get a little darker. Not, it wasn't dark, but he could tell the sun was getting lower in the sky. And he went to his desk and the parrot was like fluttered his wings and hopped up into the swing that he had. And he said to the merchant, did you, did you see my family? Um, did you take, did you take my message? And the merchant, he really didn't want to say, but he, he looked up from the desk and he said, I'm so sorry to bring you this news, but after I gave your message to your relatives, one of them fell out of the tree and I think they died. And I don't understand it, but I'm so sad to tell you, but I think one of your relatives died on hearing the news. And at that moment, the parrot in the cage dropped from the swing to the bottom of the cage. And he didn't move. And the merchant pushed back his chair and he walked over to the cage and he was looking and he opened it and reached in and took out the parrot and he was smoothing the par the feathers and he said i'm what what has happened i'm so sorry how is this possible you've been such a good friend and companion and he walked with the parrot in his hands to the window and he was standing there and tears coming down his face 
when all of a sudden the parrot flew up out of his hand and just outside of the window and the parrot said to the merchant thank you thank you for taking my message to my relatives and you see they've sent a message back to me and the merchant said what what do you mean they said they they let me know that it was my golden voice that was keeping me captive in the cage and now you have set me free and i want to thank you and i want to wish you the freedom that you have given me. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, thank you. That was wonderful, wonderful. So I'm checking on my time. Are we, am I yeah. out of my time? Or do you no, have you time? actually can do the story, I think. Oh, the song, okay. I mean the song. Okay, I'll do the song. All right, thank okay. you. Oh shoot, where is she going? Thank you. Okay, so this is this song. I'm going to use an auto harp, and this song is a melody that I set, and it's a poem that comes from Robert Francis. And I have to let me just make a little adjustment. I have finger picks on, and you can't do anything with finger picks with a, a mouse on your computer. This is a good thing. <laughs> You can't wear finger picks when you use your computer. So this is a poem. My family has a practice. This particularly the women in my family have a practice, and maybe you have family members too, who send poems to each other. And this was sent to me by my cousin a number of years ago. It was at the end of her Christmas letter, and it was written by Robert Francis, and he was born in 1901. It's called Good Night Near Christmas. And now, good night. Good night to this old house whose breathing fires are banked for their night's rest. Good night to lighted windows in the west. Good night to neighbors and to neighbors' cows whose morning milk will be beside my door. Good night to one star shining in. Good night to earth, poor earth, with its uncertain light. One little wandering planet still at war. Good night to one unstarved and gnawing mouse. Between the inner and the outer wall. A paper nest in which to crawl. Good night to hot men who have no bed, no house. Good night to one unstarved and gnawing mouse. Between the inner and the outer wall, he has a paper nest in which to crawl. Good night to men who have no bed, no house. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, thank you, Angela. 
Um, welcome, most welcome. So that uh, concludes our program. Um, I would just like to thank all of the storytellers who told wonderful, wonderful stories. It, it just was magnificent. Um, we still have some time on the Zoom connection. Uh, perhaps Marion will, will stop the recording, but we can interact with each other after the recording is over. But I just like to say uh, uh, it's been a pleasure to work with Marion to plan this and, and a pleasure to be a part of this joint celebration. And likewise, it's a pleasure to work with Inland Valley Storytellers. So if Zooming continues, we'll be partnering up uh, yeah, with a different uh, swap next year. And it's really fun to get acquainted with storytellers in the north and the south of California that we didn't know before. So it's wonderful. Thank you for bringing your stories to us. And we're happy to take stories to you. So Zoom is bringing us together. And we all know really from around the world, it's pretty <laughs> crazy, but fascinating and uh, interesting all at the same time. So yes, thank you one and all for my listeners uh, from North California for joining us this day. Thank you folks. We're gonna stop thank you, the everybody. recording. Wonderful, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm just going to remind oh, people they can save guys. the chat. If you want to save the chat, 